Welcome to Double Standards with me, Afshin Ratansi, a new leader in booming China, President Obama, back in the White House in declining America. This week we investigate the revenge of history. Coming up in the show, we accompany Britain's David Cameron as he sells torture equipment to Persian Gulf dictatorships. Our reporter Lester Square asks about beheading women drivers. And as China elects a new leader and President Obama continues to fail in his attempts to save free market capitalism, we talk to The Guardian's Seamus Milne about the battle for the 21st century. Well, doubtless you've been watching coverage of the most important election of 2012. Yes, the real international election of note is happening right now. But as a new general secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China is elected, let's see what that favorite of the American right thought of the outgoing leader. Our top story tonight, Rush Limbaugh mocks Chinese President Hu Jintao. <laughs> As General Secretary Hu Jintao prepares to vacate his post, he was quick to get his own back. This just in. President Hu Jintao of China has responded to Rush Limbaugh's radio show. Let's take a look. Rush Limbaugh, poo poo, bow wow, howdy doody. It's great to see who won the White House as regards the situation in Syria. After all, what would have happened if President Obama had lost? The difference in policy is clear. I believe that Assad must go. Assad has to go. I don't want to have our military involved in, in Syria. For us to get more entangled militarily in Syria is a serious step. So the right course for us is working through our partners. In consultation with our partners. To identify responsible parties within Syria. Mobilizing the moderate forces. Organize them. Helping the opposition organize. We do need to make sure. Making absolutely certain. That they don't have arms. Arms in the wrong hands. Folks who eventually could turn them against us. To hurt us down the road. Thank, Thank you. Let's now go straight to UK media coverage of the US elections and the detailed analysis provided by Rupert Murdoch's Sky News Channel. <laughs> it's your fault. And the Pierce has to take responsibility. <laughs> she, right, she's been told her phone was hacked. <laughs> This week, one of the most famous perfumes in the world is being banned by European Union scientists because of an ingredient. The ingredient responded. Inevitable. Well, US President Obama won another term. What our leaders say matter because the American people need to trust that we're saying what we mean and that we're meaning what we say. Mm. What we need a president who's in the business of solving problems, and we will solve those problems by bringing the country together. Because when I'm president, meetings where laws are written will be more open to the public, no more secrecy. That's a commitment I make to you as president. I'll continue also to fight for what the American people care most about. New jobs, higher wages, and faster economic growth. That's why we're going to set a goal of 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And we will meet it with higher fuel standards and new investment in renewable fuels that can create millions of new jobs and entire new industries right here in America. For Americans who get their insurance through the workplace, your employer, it's estimated, would see premiums fall by as much as 3,000%, which means they could give you a raise. Fascinating to me to see lately my campaign criticized because I talk about hope too much. Oh, he's, he's talking about hope again. He's so naive. He's so idealistic. His head's in the clouds. He's... He needs a reality check. Well, as American politics continues in the same old way, we have an aspiring politician to talk to now, none other than the daughter of former U.S. President Bill Clinton. Hello, Chelsea Clinton. You want to join the government of the United States? The government of Nigeria uh, 
today. Nigeria. You want to run Nigeria. Why there? How many dollars has their government put into your bank account for this? Um, currently, there are about a million. Did your father-in-law have anything to do with this Nigeria deal? He went to jail for five years for Nigerian email scams. Who put you up to this? Uh, primarily by the Nigerian Ministry of Health uh, in conjunction with uh, other global partners and then also lots of local partners here in Nigeria. After your illustrious educational career, your interest in women's rights, what have you learned in Nigeria and what is your message? Um, you know, die here in Nigeria. And, and for me, you know, so much of that really is about, about women's rights. You really are running for office in Nigeria. I understand it pays a lot of money. Uh, oh, gosh, I don't know about that. Your father, of course, abolished the Glass-Steagall Act, widely seen as catalyzing the current capitalist crisis. What do you see as a consequence? Maternal and child deaths every year. Would you say you are also continuing the family tradition by marrying a man who worked at your father's favorite bank, Goldman Sachs? Who were the main casualties of Goldman Sachs' corruption? The vast majority of them are our children. Your mother loved the policy of assassinating children using drones. Do you agree with that type of public service? I certainly believe my mother's life is a testament to that. Were you always for it? Before my mom's campaign in 2008, I would have said no. Uh, not as the result of any sort of long, deliberate, thoughtful process. Your father held direct talks with the Afghan Taliban as they began to sponsor Osama bin Laden. What do you think is the legacy of your father's foreign policy in Afghanistan? You know, we saw last week in Pakistan what happened when a 14-year-old girl was singled out on a bus and shot. I see. Well, many thanks, Chelsea Clinton. Just before you go, do you think you will ruin the lives of as many people as your parents? Your mom, of course, is leaving the U.S. State Department. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Mrs. Clinton? And what happened to your daughter? Sorry. Very sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea and Hillary Clinton. Well, while mainstream media are obsessed about some kind of election happening in the USA, David Cameron, there he is, was selling killing machines to anti-democratic Arab Wahhabi dictators. David Cameron, David Cameron, why are you selling weapons to Arab dictators? Maybe I can catch up with him at the press conference. I must get rid of my Blackberry. I think it's making the... There we are. Oh, dear. What are you throwing, Mr. Cameron? Is that some sort of new electric shock baton that you and your ambassador try to sell to dictators? The ones that look like cricket bats. Is the ambassador going to play cricket with the crown prince? Our ambassador doesn't play cricket, obviously. The ambassador might not be able to play cricket, but I bet he's useless at battleships too. Pretty good at tear gas, though, which is a variation of Ludo. So, aside from his drone assassination programs and attempts at destabilizing democratically elected governments, what else did President Obama get up to during his term in office, specifically in his so-called backyard? Well, back in 2011, he met with Panamanian President Ricardo Martinelli. Here they are talking about baseball. If, uh, Mr. President, you have uh, somebody who's the next uh, Mariano Rivera, make sure they go to the Chicago White Sox. The White Sox, that's, no, that's, not the that's, Yankees. Uh, not the Yankees. <laughs> they've, they've, they've had enough. But it wasn't just baseball they wanted to talk about. It was also Obama's desire for the spread of neoliberalism in Panama, that crucial Central American country with a canal. Uh, we are very pleased by the progress that we've made in moving forward a U.S.-Panamanian uh, free trade agreement. Let's have a look at how that's worked. Here's Panama in the past week or so. Gunshots rang out in the Panamanian city of Colón on Monday as a demonstration against the selling of state-owned land near the Panama Canal turned violent. In this historic electoral week for China, we've got David Mahal to go through some of the cartoons from around the world. How's it going, David? You good? Um, it's going, going well. I'm, I'm very happy, actually. Quite oh, happy. Right. Yes, well, the world is now safe for Big Bird. Uh, yes, of course, the election you didn't mention that everyone ha has had their eyes on is the U.S. And, and Obama won a second term. No change That's right. in America. In your face, Republicans. That's right. All of the lying, all of the cheating, all of the propaganda, all of the unlimited amounts of money, all of the faulty voting machines that gave it to the Republicans, Let's no matter the what. the drone killer all in power. Of the, all of the voter ID things, all the changing people's registrations so that they would show up at the voting polling places and being told, oh, no, your polling place is 50 miles down the road. All of those efforts failed. And still, Obama got a second office. So, so the drone yeah. killer's in power. Excellent. Let's go to this cartoon. Just go through it. 
Yeah, and here we have, uh, we have Mitt Romney saying, on the bright side, I do have $250 million. With, uh, of course, uh, Anne Romney. Yeah, go, yes, 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 you, yes, we do. Um, actually, she's So worth... anti-women, like all you Democrats. Anyway, yeah? No, I think you've confused things. Sesame Street was inaugurated in 1969, you know, on this day. And basically, the important thing about the election, Sesame Street, as you mentioned, that's it. Yeah. No, no, the important thing is that this is good for education. This is good for the environment. This is good for what tar sands XL pipeline i thought obama was going ahead with that it goes forward and back I, I, let's go yeah. to this quickly of course something else was happening take us through it well yeah greece uh, greece has just had their <laughs> their unemployment come out for august because that's the most recent data um and it's over 25 percent. it's 25.4 percent which is up from july and slowly uh we see a sort of creep towards uh eu helping out greece but what we're not what I mean, the problem is... Austerity is working, though. Yeah, they had 30... Well, no, it's not. I mean, that's the problem. The uh, public sector workers have lost 40% of their income. And with this 13.5 billion euro cut that they just went through, it looks like that's going to be cut further. And there's a problem, I mean, with people who are making, you know, X, X number of euros, and that's what they base their living on, and now they're making half as many. I mean, it's, that becomes untenable. You're going to have people being coming homeless, people going hungry, and, you know, the firefighters, the policemen, the, all the public sector The policemen? Workers. I thought they were full of the Black Dawn or these Nazis now. Uh, in a sense, some people are saying police so. Police are public sector workers. Right, but the police yeah. are being infiltrated by the neo-Nazis. I would say that uh, what, some like people... like that's unique in Greece? Well, some people think, basically, they didn't vote Syriza, so... Oh, I'm just hearing Greece did burn down. Anyway, you're off to, <laughs> so, uh, to uh, your uh, comedy club to... Crow about the Obama win. Well, I'm actually off to South End. Open up a new venue in South End. South End on C in Essex. Yeah. People in around the world watching this won't know what Essex means, but uh, yeah, some people will. Thank okay. you. See you next week. See you next week. So free market capitalism is in crisis, NATO military dominance is on the wane, and mass movements fighting US-backed dictatorship are on the rise. They never said this would happen when the Berlin Wall fell down. Someone who has consistently predicted the winds of change is associate editor of the UK Guardian newspaper, Seamus Milne, whose book, The Revenge of History, charts the battle for the 21st century. James Milne, welcome to Double Standards. I was there at the fall of the Berlin Wall and everyone was talking about the victory of the uh, neoliberal order. Your book presenting a completely different view to that of any uh, BBC journalist or mainstream media journalist might. Um, why do you think that is? Well, that's what we were told at the time. At the beginning of the 1990s, we were told that that was the end of history even. We were told that uh, this was the, you know, the end of uh, the battle of ideologies. Uh, free market capitalism had won and uh, socialism had been consigned to history. It would be a unipolar world. This was a new world order. And uh, so that was the reality that we lived through um, in the you know, decade afterwards. But I, what I argue is that between the 9-11 attacks and the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008, that new world order, which was inaugurated by George Bush Sr. in 1990, crumbled and fell. And we've seen in that period between 2001 and 2008, first of all, the exposure, instead of the extent of American military power in the world, of the limits of American military power, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, which showed that, that both those wars showed that in the end, a people prepared to fight back cannot have uh, the glo global imperial interests imposed upon them. Secondly, in 2008, we saw the discrediting of the neoliberal order. We'd been told that that was the only way to run a prosperous modern economy, that only through deregulation of finance and markets, through privatization and low taxes on the wealthy, could there be um, a successful modern economy. And all that crashed and burned in the crisis of 2008 that we're still living through today. Um, and we also saw in the same period the rise of China as a great economic power. And that economic advance was achieved through state-driven investment over, uh, overall. And particularly in the crisis of 2008 onwards, it showed its uh, success in riding out the Western crisis. And finally, we saw the rise of the progressive tide in Latin America, where the 
the left and radical governments, socialist and social democratic governments in Latin America, turned their back on neoliberalism and used the fact that the United States was involved in the war on terror in the Middle East and the Arab and Muslim world to carve out regional independence and integration for the first time really in 500 years in Latin America and to turn their backs on neoliberalism, fighting social and racial injustice and, and really creating something new when we'd been told there were no alternatives in the 21st century. So I think all those four advances, I'd say, because they were, they were contradictory advances, but they were advances for most people in the world, have shown that that story of the end of history, the new world order, the triumph of neoliberal capitalism has, been, has basically been exploded. And we're living through the consequences of that now. And, and the question really for the future is, and this is being played out in the Arab world and the Arab uprisings and elsewhere, is you know, what kind of new order and what kind of new alternatives, social and political alternatives, can be carved out in this period. OK, but uh, in fairness, some of the members of the elite, governors of uh, central banks, economists, have apologized, maybe not begged for forgiveness. You also pick, uh, as a uh, very important critical point, the uh, war in Georgia in the uh, uh, former Warsaw Pact. Uh, why Georgia? Well, I think in the Georgian war, which was the war between Russia and Georgia in the late summer of 2008, uh, we saw a moment where the end of the unipolar world, the world that would be dominated by one hyperpower, the United States and its allies, and there would be no rivals, where that world fell. And, and it was symbolized by what happened in Georgia. If you remember, um, the Georgian state, which was an authoritarian, neoconservative government, which was supported by the Bush administration in Washington, very, very strongly, it had taken part, its forces had taken part in the occupation of Iraq, attacked Russian forces in the contested territory of South Ossetia in August 2008. And Russian forces struck back very strongly. And at that time, the United States government, uh, George Bush, said that it was an outrage, that it was an aggression in the 21st century which couldn't be allowed to stand. This from a guy who'd ordered the greatest act of uh, unprovoked aggression in modern American history, which was the invasion and occupation of Iraq. And uh, he said that the Russian forces must withdraw, and he was echoed by the then British Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, and that there could be no question of uh, recognition of South Ossetia's independence. And the Russian state ignored him and uh, recognized South Ossetia's independence, and the American warships were left sailing impotently round the Black Sea. And I think it encapsulated that exposure of the limits of American military power, which, as I say, really flowed from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, we, we saw President Obama trying to cling on to Mubarak in Egypt as part of that Arab Spring, and I know you write about that in your book. How do you see it progressing now? Because Bahrain is off certainly the mainstream media agenda. You're, you know, at The Guardian, a mainstream media publication. How do you see that playing out now? Because uh, the Arab Spring, apart from the intervention by David Cameron here in Libya, doesn't seem to really be in the news. Well, the Arab Spring, I see as, a, as driven by popular revulsion against authoritarian regimes and popular uprisings. But of course, all sorts of forces in the world have tried to take advantage of it, steer it, divert it, hijack it. And the United States, Britain and France, as the big powers who are dominant, outside powers who are dominant in the Middle East, in particular, after the shock of the loss of Egypt, as it seemed to, at the time, and the loss of Tunisia, which were both allied authoritarian governments, um, tried to take control of, the, of what's called the Arab Spring in, in Libya by sort of hijacking it, intervening, and, and really intervening in the name of uh, the protection of civilians, but actually increasing by a factor of between 10 and 20 the death toll in that country and leading to large-scale ethnic cleansing and the chaos we've got in Libya today. And of course, something similar is, is going on in Syria. But I think it's important to see that the forms of intervention they're using are much more hands-off and obviously they're, they're desperate to avoid troops on the ground because they saw the consequences of that in terms of resistance and strategic setback or defeat in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I think we're seeing that played out now. And of course, in countries like Bahrain or now you've got in Kuwait, in uh, the United Arab Emirates um, and in Jordan, you see the, the spirit of the Arab uprising spreading to uh, the, mon the monarchies, the Gulf monarchies and the Western-backed 
autocrats and dictators. And I think that's a process which is going to play out very dramatically in the next few years. Any particular difference between Romney or Obama now that Obama has won with respect to those Persian Gulf monarchies and uh, foreign policy? Well, I think the British, American and French and other Western interests in the Gulf are very, very powerful. You know, we've got American military bases all over the Gulf. So and they'll continue to support the anti-democratic forces? I think they countries. will, but of course the, the, the democratic forces and the, the forces of uprising in the region are setting the tone and making their own history, and so that will cha change the balance of power. I think that Romney would have been more likely to support uh, military action against Iran and aggression against Iran, but it's of course not ruled out that Obama might do that himself. But I think it's not written in the stars, and that's what's going to be played out in the next period and what's happening now in the Gulf where people are well, taking... David Cameron was there this week selling exactly, weapons. Exactly, selling arms to the dictators. And, and the, the fact that people right now in those countries are taking their future in their own hands is something I think we should take confidence from. Thank you very much, Seamus Milne. A great read, The Revenge of History, The Battle for the 21st Century. Thank you. Now it's time for People of Britain. Let's go to our roaming reporter. It's time for our special section, People of Britain. And I think it's Leicester Square by a telephone booth in central London. Hello, I've said... Oh, hang on a minute. No, Lloyd Blankfein couldn't win. Goldman Sachs cannot go into the White House directly. No, it had to be this. Anyway, you're happy with who's now in the White House? Good. All right, sorry, I've said... Just took a quick phone call there. People of Britain time. <laughs> David Cameron has gone to Saudi Arabia to explore new ideas for women's rights in Britain. Yeah. Do you think we could learn quite a bit from Saudi Arabia on women's rights? I don't believe so, no. Say a ban on women drivers? <laughs> you think that's a good idea? I think it's a good idea all over the world, a ban on women drivers. British Prime Minister has gone to Saudi Arabia today. Yeah. Do you think uh, we could learn a lot about women's rights from Saudi Arabia, where he's gone to research things? I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> what about women drivers, though? In Saudi Arabia, they're not allowed to drive. Uh, would that be good in Britain? I think it's wrong. But they would only be beheaded if they happen to be caught driving. I don't understand. <laughs> But uh, they're not, women are not allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. Do you think they should bring that to Britain? No, of course not. Public anything, execution? Anything that takes freedom away from anybody is wrong. And anything that gives freedom to people is correct. David Cameron has gone to Saudi Arabia today to research women's rights. Do you think uh, that we should learn quite a bit from them? To research women's rights. Yeah. He's probably gone there to butter them up to make sure the oil keeps flowing, surely. Well, he's selling arms, I think, to them as well. But do you think we could learn maybe about public executions and so on? Yeah, I think we have to lot, a lot to learn from the Saudis. Law and order, they chop people's hands off, don't they? Women, do women can't drive. I'm sure that would, uh, uh, that would please a lot of men here who talk about women drivers. So yeah, I think Cameron could learn a lot from this trip. Do you think nuclear weapons in the prisons here would be a bit of overkill? Nuclear weapons in the prisons? What do you mean? I well, I mean, they could use nuclear <laughs> weapons to behead people. Uh, are you having a laugh? <laughs> Do you think we could learn about women's rights from Saudi Arabia? Probably. <laughs> Would they behead people? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I think we don't really have enough women's rights here. Um, I work in a field where we deal with a lot of domestic violence. They're cutting back already on refuges and sanctions for women. And I think really before we start looking externally, we need to look internally about what we're doing for women's rights here. But don't you think it's more important to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia? No. Than work in your field? Um, <laughs> um, no, I definitely don't think it's more important to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, even though the British government probably does. Then they could bring in a ban on women driving, like in Saudi. <laughs> Is that a good idea? Don't worry. We are better than you guys. I'm sorry. So you're against the beheading of women in public squares or Wembley Stadium? Oh, Wembley might be all right. Beheading in Wembley Stadium, a good idea or a bad idea? This is, you know, I, I think it depends. If this is going to make a difference to the public opinion about the crime and the reduced crime rate, I think maybe it's good. Oh, well, David Cameron visiting Saudi Arabia about women's rights. Good idea. Thank you. Sorry. There you have it, Afshin, the voices of the people of Britain. Oh, another phone call. Hong Kong. Look, I can't choose who's going to be the head of the Communist Party of China. So you're not happy with it? You're not happy with it? 
Uh, anyway, uh, I uh, see you next week. Obviously, uh, someone's not happy with the new leader of China. Thanks, Lester. See you next week for more people of Britain. You can email us at comment at doublestandardstv.com. See you next week.